So I'm very happy to, to welcome Natasha Pulchul here today. She's a star in computational biology. Um, I remember reading her papers about graphlets as a, as a PhD student um, already and as, as, a, as a young uh, professor. Uh, so uh, Natasha did her PhD in, in computer science in Toronto, then became an assistant professor at UC Irvine, then moved to UCL in London, um, where she grew like all the career steps of a professor from assistant to full professor. And uh, recently she additionally joined the Catalan Institution for Research and Advanced Studies, IGRIA, and uh, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Along the way, she won numerous awards, uh, three individual ERC grants, and she was um, admitted to several academies. Uh, I'll list a few here, the British Computer Society, Academy of Computing, the Young Academy of Europe, uh, then the, the Academy of, of Europe, and uh, two years ago, the Serbian Royal Academy of Scientists and Artists. So we are very happy to, to have you here, Natasha. We are very much looking forward to learn about your recent work about COVID-19. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karsten. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for this kind uh, introduction. Um, so today I will present uh, first an overview of what we have been doing over the past, I don't know, 15, 17 years or so, uh, in the sense that we view medicine as a complex world of interconnected entities that needs to be mined for additional biological information. And uh, I have to uh, start with uh, motivating why we are doing what we are doing, why we need new methods. Then I'll only have the time to give some illustrative examples of these new methods that we develop, how to mine these interconnected data. And in that regard, I will describe how uh, uh, to design new methods to mine single type of omics data. And that Karsten mentioned, uh, mostly based on graphlets. Um, and then uh, I will focus more on how do we mine multiple layers of heterogeneous data. I will talk about two applications only in cancer uh, and in COVID-19. But basically, it all uh, uh, we need to understand all of the steps to be able to understand how we came up with our predictions for a repurposing of approved drugs for COVID-19 patients. And in the end, I will conclude, and, and because this is, a, this is a school, I will uh, say something about my views of what we need in the future of this field. Okay, so let's start with the motivation. <clears throat> Technological advances have yielded an astounding harvest of various molecular and clinical data in biology and medicine. We are witnessing explosion in the availability of genomes, epigenomes, transcriptomes, proteomes, metabolomes, genomes, exposomes, metagenomes, et cetera, et cetera. And this is uh, what we mean when we say omic data. <clears throat> this data growth was guided by empirical reductionism that was striving to dissect a biological entity into its constituent parts to better understand. However, even in the times of Charles Darwin, uh, back 150, 170 years ago, we knew that knowing parts is not enough. Darwin, in his original species, wrote that biology is a tangled bank with all of its entities interconnected. At the same time in Germany, Birkhoff's pioneering observation that all diseases involve changes in normal cells has forever changed the way we practice medicine. This data growth about the cell has now made us hit the wall of biocomplexity. We know that cells are not just loosely coupled arrangements of quasi-independent molecules, but highly intricately and precisely integrated networks of entities and interactions within the cell and with the environment. All of these different data types complement each other, and this is why they seek joint modeling and mining. So the time now has come to replace the mostly reductionist molecular perspective that dominated the 20th century with a new and a holistic view of the living world that's required to explain biological and medical phenomena and biology's innate complexity. 
however, that requires establishing a perspective and framework, not only for one problem, but for biology and medicine in general, with the foremost challenge being how to resynthesize biology, how to put all of its elements back into their complex dynamic environments, connect them all within a unifying framework and reformulate biological paradigms within our nonlinear world. So my vision has been to bridge this gap by developing mathematically principled frameworks for integration of all network data that will marry biomedical problems and data with algorithms from all sorts of computer science, uh, mathematics, such as machine learning, uh, mathematical nonlinear optimization, network science, algebraic topology, et cetera, et cetera. And due to computational intractability of the problems that we are dealing with on large data sets, we have to do all of these are approximate and we have to do it using high performance computing. And this is why I'm now <laughs> sitting in one of the largest supercomputing centers in the world. So uh, we will see how we propose modeling and computational advances that hopefully will link the medicines reductionist past with its holistic future and enable displacement of the dominant molecular representation of biology with a new and integrative paradigm that is deeper more comprehensive and more inspiring. And I'm currently holding an ERC consolidator grant to do this. And very recently, I've also received a proof of concept grant to actually commercialize the results of the consolidator grant. And in the past, uh, I had an ERC starting grant and some of the first results I'll show were, uh, uh, were results of that one. Now, computational challenges. I'm not sure uh, who is in the audience. But uh, basically, why do we need the tools, new tools to mine these data? We have so much. Why isn't what we have enough? So while we've had genomic sequences for quite some time now, maybe 20 years or more, uh, and the problems dealing with aligning sequences are so-called computationally easy, meaning that we can exactly solve them in the time polynomial to the size of the input data. And we still have no idea really what the genome is doing. Our gaps in the knowledge are vast. Dealing with network data, with large networks, it's much more, it's much more complicated in the sense that these problems are computationally tractable, and hard, and complete, et cetera, et cetera. There are many of these classes. This means that we can mathematically prove that we cannot exactly solve these problems on large data sets, even given all the compute power of the world and all the time of the universe. This is what it means. But we still want to solve them. And our only way to do that is approximately solving them. This comes from uh, the theory of computation, right? One such problem seems trivial aligning or comparing two networks. There is an underlying uh, computation intractable subgraph isomorphism problem that tells us we cannot do this. And this is why our only way of addressing this is by uh, designing these approximate methods, but carefully tuned to extract new knowledge from particular data. Because an inherent property of every approximate method, every heuristic is that it is guaranteed to fail on certain data. This is what computational intractability means. You cannot have universal solutions. This is why machine learning methods can trivially fail uh, you know, to, to uh, the tasks that are trivial to a human eye, right? So, this is why we designed these carefully tailored heuristics to extract new knowledge from individual data types. So now when we have various biotechnologies, they're measuring different things, but of the same thing, of, of, the, of the cell. So we have gene co-expressions where nodes would be genes and, in, uh, and if they are co-expressed in a cell or under uh, certain condition, there is an edge connected and link connecting them or physical protein-protein interactions or bindings between proteins to do something or epistatic uh, uh, genetic interactions, metabolic interactions, etc. So we want to extract information out of each of these individuals. Also, we have various ontologies, such as disease ontology, gene ontology. We have drugs and their chemical similarity, side effects that link them, et cetera, et cetera. Once we can extract information, as much information as possible from each of these layers, another challenge is how to integrate them, fuse them to see what they collectively tell us, and also 
how to put that in a patient-centric way to improve tasks of precision medicine. So we wouldn't treat all of the patients of COVID in the same way, but certain patients need certain treatments and others different treatments based on their genetics and exposure. Right, so this ends the motivation. And let me just go over uh, these uh, new methods, some illustrations. Uh, how to mine one type of uh, molecular data or mixed data, network data, to learn about biological function of genes and proteins about disease. I will give some examples uh, from cancer, leukemia, uh, rare disease, etc. All right. So as I mentioned, uh, one of the main workhorses of the cell is a so-called protein-protein interaction network. While genes are a blueprint, they code for proteins and do other things. Uh, 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 once the proteins are made, they're three-dimensional structures that usually don't do anything by themselves, but they bind together through the physical binding, they change their three-dimensional conformation and uh, do a particular thing, whether they cut other proteins, whether they transport something from one part of the cell to the next, etc. So to abstract all of this, we model uh, the proteins as nodes in the network, any physical binding is possible, we put an edge or a link. And then presented with two uh, protein interaction network, let's say of a, of a healthy and a disease cell, uh, we want to compare them. We just said, <laughs> we cannot do that exactly. And this is why over the past 20 years or so, uh, uh, people started comparing simple things. These are simple heuristics, how we are trying to figure out, are these networks similar or not? So we compare their sizes, the numbers of nodes and edges, are they similar or not? Then the number of links that a node has is so-called degree. We compare the distribution of degrees over all nodes in one network versus in another network to try to figure out if they're similar. But uh, this is an illustration how very uh, uh, quickly you can come up with these examples on which all of your heuristics will fail. Uh, and this is one example of the network G and H that are exactly of the same size same numbers of nodes and edges, exactly the same degree distribution. Each node in each network has two edges incident to it. Uh, and then you can just eyeball them and see that they're very different. One is connected to start with and another one is not. And this is why quite some time ago in 2004, I came up with the notion of graphlets, which are small subgraphs of large networks that I view as Legos of networks. Uh, and basically I'm asking whether uh, we can figure out by the way these uh, uh, graphlets are uh, uh, um, put together in the network in the end, in Lego terms, do we have a pumpkin or do we have a helicopter? And this was a subject of my starting grant, ERC starting grant. And uh, it's not enough just to count them, but at the same computation complexity with counting them, you can get much more information. If you observe the symmetries within them, so-called automorphism orbit, but let's not get into the mathematics because uh, I would like to have this flow of, you know, from, from these data to COVID patients, right? Uh, so uh, you, you can, uh, let me just illustrate what we do with these graphlets. So let's say we have this network and this node A in the network, okay? So we are going to generate a feature vector of the wiring around that node. How is that node wired in the network as follows. The first coordinate in this feature ve vector will be how many edges it touches. The edge is the only two node graphlet, okay? Connected graphlet, okay? So it touches four edges and this is why this coordinate is four. Then we are going to count how many three node paths node A touches, but at an end node, at the wide node. And you'll see that's three, one, two, and three, right? Et cetera. We will count how many triangles it touches, one triangle, which is why that coordinate is one. How many squares it touches, one square, that's why that coordinate is one, et cetera. And this is how we generate these feature vectors of the node. And then you can push these through machine learning methods if you wish. And, um, then we can do this for all nodes. And then we have this matrix of these feature vectors on the nodes. You can compare these feature vectors, right? To figure out something about the nodes if their wiring is similar because wiring is indicative of similarity in biological function and involvement in disease. Or if you want to figure something out about the network, you can go along the columns. And this first column or zeroth column here is your degree uh, distribution. 
right? And then you have graphlet, uh, uh, sorry, orbit one distribution. I don't see my mouse. Okay, orbit one distribution, orbit two distribution, many distributions about these networks. And then you compare all of these distributions to figure out if the networks are similar. Again, this is a, an approximation, right? But we are putting many numbers there to guarantee that these are similar. And I'm missing some slides, but it doesn't matter. Okay, hopefully not. So we use this in network alignment. Um, uh, we said the network alignment is computationally intractable. So we did various ways how to, you know, uh, see the networks around the nodes that are similarly wired and then extend around them or do all sorts of other tricks to align networks, let's say, of yeast and human, because yeast is much more annotated, much more studied, much more known than human. So we could possibly transfer annotation from yeast to human. Um, we found out that uh, the similarity in the wiring patterns of the proteins in protein interaction networks means similarity in biological uh, function, membership protein complexes, similarity in subcellular localization, tissue co-expression and involvement in disease in human, but not only for nearby nodes, such as these two, but also the faraway nodes that reside in the network neighborhood that looks like the mirror image of this one. This illustration, this is a drawing or an illustration. I mean, it's real data, but it's a, it's a drawing to illustrate. And then we push these through simple machine learning methods to figure out that this uh, basically correlation between uh, um, uh, wiring patterns around proteins in the network and their involvement in certain actually their, their, their certain biological function uh, uh, carries from yeast to human. For instance, membrane proteins look like these hubby ones, while transcription factors are more clustered, etc. Early on, like 11 years ago, we validated biologically uh, that uh, uh, this, uh, in this way, by observing only the wiring patterns, we can find uh, new cancer genes. In this particular uh, case, was uh, genes uh, participating in melanin production pathways, which is implicated in in skin cancer, of course, and our predictions were phenotypically validated by siRNA screens of Professor Gunnison at UC Irvine, where I was. Uh, quite some time ago now. <laughs> okay, um, but our recent work that uh, got published last year in our ISMB conference, the top conference in the field with acceptance rates of around 15%, we use these methods uh, to study now, not the protein interaction network, but the new type of data that recently emerged, so-called chromatin structure network. Basically the DNA is a very long molecule uh, and uh, <laughs> you know, it couldn't fit into the small nucleus if it wasn't packed in a very particular way and very ordered way. And now we have these data, basically which parts of the DNA, even though they are very far away in the sequence, they are packed together very close in space in the nucleus. And if they are packed close, close in space in the nucleus, once they, you know, this part of, of uh, the chromatin gets pushed around and gets transcribed because of the same transcription factors bind there, then they, uh, uh, they can be transcribed together, right? So they can, don't have to be close in sequence, but you know, if they're close in space, they, they can uh, be transcribed at, uh, at the same time. So these are these chromatin structure networks, basically which parts of the DNA are in close proximity. And we took these uh, uh, chromatin structure networks of uh, chronic uh, lymphatic leukemia, CLL cells, and the control cells, naive B cells. This is where leukemia, this kind of leukemia originates from. And uh, uh, this is just a visualization of this chromatin structure network of the naive B cell, of the control, of the healthy. Uh, cell and the CLL cell. And you can see that basically chromatin structure is destroyed. This is just a spring embedding that we use for visualization. In the left, you can see in the healthy cell, clear cluster, clear organization, and on the right-hand side is a mess. And we kind of knew this, uh, that, that uh, basically the, uh, <laughs> the rearrangements of the, of the genetic material in, in cancers, but what is interesting is that this structural difference exists in normal cells, even before CLL hits, which means that there are these hotspots in the packing of the chromatin where the mutations and rearrangements take place. So anyways, if you'd like to learn more, uh, uh, here, this is the paper from last July, 
and we need to move on in our talk. So uh, these graphed based measures, we generalize to directed networks. They are very well performing, the best performing for network analysis so far. They're very robust to noise. I have not addressed this, but everywhere we test for robustness to noise because biological data are no different than any other data. All data have noise, right? So we need to deal with that. Um, uh, quite a while ago, back in 2004, I was the first one to propose that protein interaction and was actually geometric. And we've seen now the advent of uh, geometric, uh, geometric um, topological data analysis, geometric deep learning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can track the dynamics of the networks, how they change, how the nodes change in different networks through time, et cetera. Also in ECCB last year in September, also one of the top conferences, similar acceptance rate as, as ISMB, about 15, 20%. Uh, we have proposed probabilistic networks uh, and basically we've shown that they better, this, when they have probabilities on the edges, they better identify. So basically <laughs> graphlets are generalized to have probabilities on the edges. And if you use that, for your data that is probabilistic, you can better identify condition-specific functions in the cell. Uh, we generalized Laplacians to graphlet Laplacian, uh, Laplacians, this was in bioinformatics two years ago. In the same paper, we generalized spectral embedding and clustering to deal with these graphlet Laplacians. Uh, and we have shown that by using these, uh, 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 we, we can get different and complementary annotations. And graphlets have not only been used in biology, uh, uh, bioinformatics, they're used uh, in other areas, for instance, for image categories recognition, scene classification, photo cropping, et cetera. Then uh, in social networks for personality and affective states, recognitions in large corporations to maximize productivity, um, in theoretical computer science, et cetera. And let me just uh, say a few words about multi-scale organization, uh, because um, in the cell, uh, it's not only entities and their pairwise interactions. Sometimes several interactions are necessary at the same time, for instance, for a protein complex to be functional. So for instance, if we have this protein complex of three proteins, we modeled it as three nodes and three edges, like that, as a triangle. But also, if we have three complexes of two proteins each, we model it in the same way. And in this way, if we do this, we lose uh, biological information. So a better way to model it is that this complex of three proteins is one set of three nodes, while these three complexes of two proteins each are three sets of two nodes each, right? And this can be captured, of course, by hypergraph. This is not a new notion. Mathematicians have known it for a long time. Uh, in 89, Claude Burge had a, a, a very good uh, book on that. Um, so basically, hypergraphs are just like graphs in the sense that they have the nodes, but the edges are not only between pairs of nodes, but it can be any subset of nodes. That, you know, that's a hyper edge. And in systems biology, previously, only some uh, simple measures were generalized, such as centrality and clustering, or maybe degree distribution, and general you know, modeling considerations were explained. But then we went, uh, and in ECCB three years ago, we published, uh, we basically modeled the protein interaction network as protein interaction hyper network, where, where we took direct protein interactions or pairwise interactions. And also we modeled all protein complexes as hyper edges and also all pathways as hyper edges. And we have this PIH model that includes multi-scale protein interactions. And then we generalize graphlets to hyper graphlets and orbits to hyper orbits. And this is for three node uh, um, hyper graphlets, we have 60, five orbits, but if you go to four node hypergraphics, you have a feature vector over 6,000 coordinates. And then you do the same as before, you have these feature vectors and you cluster them or whatever, you do whatever you like with them. And basically we did the 
some simple canonical correlation analysis between these feature vectors and Go annotations. This particular example is about Go biological processes. And we found out that really there is this uh, strong correlation between these particular orbits here and some um, processes in the brain, synapse organization, um, learning, uh, memory, et cetera. We don't know why uh, we are computer scientists mostly in the lab, even though now we hire some biologists and, and biomedical engineers, et cetera, as the lab has grown dramatically over the past few years. Um, and then this is just from the paper an illustration that basically if you model the protein interaction network with hypergraphs uh, and analyze them with hypergraphlets, you get more, much more uh, biological information. This is uh, in terms of enrichment of the uh, of eight clusters that you Cluster, when you cluster these feature vectors of proteins, both in yeast and human. Hypergraphlets lived on uh, with Peja Radivoyat, uh, my colleague from the US. We published uh, last September, I believe, uh, hypergraphic kernels and classification of biological networks with them. Uh, so if you care, you can, you can read that. Uh, a similar notion to hypergraphlets is simplet. This is from geometry, but kind of mathematical way of, uh, so basically these are abstract simulation complexes from algebra. Um, and uh, we made, uh, an, an analogy to graphlets, we made simplets, all of these possible small uh, uh, abstract simulation complexes. We modeled protein interaction network with them in terms of uh, the regular protein interaction network with just pairwise bindings with proteins being in one dimensional simplex. And then we also took all protein complexes uh, uh, in, in the network as, as uh, modeled as, as simplicial complexes. And again, uh, we, we did the analysis based on these simplets, now these feature vectors and simplets. And uh, we are again, extracting much more biological information uh, with them than with the regular protein interaction network. So the, the red is enrichments that we get from our uh, uh, new model and new uh, uh, methods to analyze them. And the blue is the uh, uh, protein interaction network and random is at the bottom, you cannot even see. Okay, right. Now uh, we learned about graphlets and what you can do with them. And this is ongoing research in the lab, we have uh, a lab member who is still furthering this work based on graphlets. However, let's now see. So this is all for one layer of information, let's say protein interaction network, and you see that we, even within that one layer, you have multi-scale organization. But we have multiple complementary layers of biological information, and I will show you some illustration of what we do with them. And first, I will give an example in cancer, uh, and then I'll go on slowly towards COVID-19. Right, so uh, what we did in this paper from 2019 that we published in Nature Communications is the following. We take cancer specific, uh, cancer tissue and make cancer specific gene co-expression network, protein interaction network and genetic interactions from these databases here in gray in brackets and of healthy tissue controls. Um, we take these networks, we fuse them within a new model, a new network that integrates all of this information, tissue specific, cancer specific. Then we compare them using these graphlets. This is why I spent some time talking about And uh, by this comparison of these uh, um, of this new model of an integrated cell, this new network of an integrated cell that we call an eye cell, we find new cancer genes. We validate them in many ways, including through biological experiments that we did in our lab. Uh, and we show that these are new ones that do something in cancer and we cannot see them as different in any of these con constituent data types alone. They only come out of these data fusion, the, the data integration. And this is what I mean, the different data types complement each other. So we took uh, in this study, basically all of the genes uh, that appear in the protein interaction network, co-expression and genetic interaction network and all of their interactions. So while we have around 3000 genes in the overlap of these data types, we have only one 
shared interaction. And this is not a mistake. This is just basically we are uh, using different biotechnologies to look at the same thing, right? So there's only one shared interaction. And this is why uh, most of the previous data integration methods fail. And we tested all of the state of the art ones at the time. Uh, they either have memory issues. This one is based on uh, tensor factorization or uh, they diverge after about hundred iterations or they don't converge, don't produce clusters or they have very, very large number of very small clusters, et cetera, et cetera. So, this is what motivated us to do this approach. Uh, how do we make these data complement each other? How do we address this problem? So as I said, we took these uh, networks from these databases, three different kinds of omics networks. And we also took tissue specific, specific gene expression from the human protein atlas. And please know this is not microarray or RNA-seq. These are antibody staining, low throughput, low number of, number of samples. So they don't represent all patients, just a small number of patients. So if you don't see your favorite gene there, it's not a problem with the method, but because these data are like this, they're low throughput. So we only consider genes uh, that have expression available in the human protein atlas and that have at least one protein, protein interaction. Uh, and we create these tissue specific networks where nodes are genes that are expressed in the tissue expression from the human protein atlas, and they're linked by the interactions coming from these databases, PPI, COEXPI, these, these databases listed here. So these tissue-specific networks we uh, uh, create for these four most common cancers in human, and these are their control tissues, okay? the tissues of origin. And we can see that these networks are large, so you can safely do your analysis on them. They would have around uh, 10,000 nodes and 100,000 badges or so, both in the control and the cancer tissue. And what do we do with them? And this is now the key step. Okay, so we color coded here, protein interactions here as red, co-expression network as blue, and genetic interaction network as green. Now, as we all know, networks can be represented as matrices, genes to genes, and then if there is an interaction, we put the value of the interaction, whether it's one or zero, or maybe it's the value of the expression. It doesn't have to be one or zero, right? Uh, in these matrices. So these are square matrices, okay? So for these three networks, we have these three square matrices. And then we factorize them. And this is another, you know, optimization problem, you know, <laughs> computation interactable, you are minimizing the objective function, going to a local minimum, this is the best you can do. So you factorize these into the product of these matrix factors. This one is the G, this is genes time something low dimensional K. These are compressed versions of these here. And this is again, genes times K, well, K times genes, yeah? Now, so this is minimization. After that minimization, we get our G. Now we multiply G times G transpose to get a new network. This is the new model that emerges from fusion of these data, because in this factorization, this is basically we're factorizing three matrices and we are keeping this matrix factor the same through these three factorizations. This is how data fusion happens, okay? And then we have our network I cell, and we see here, here here's just an illustration. This is from reactome pathways, CAG pathways, or go biological processes. This is just a visualization that you have these clusters that are functionally enriched because the same function is presented by the same color here. So we see that I cells capture, but actually from, here from the bottom, from the bottom uh, uh, table, uh, in all of these, uh, whether it's a breast control I cell or breast cancer or prostate control, prostate cancer, et cetera, et cetera, uh, I cell is pink. We see that enrichments uh, are much higher in these clusters uh, that, that you obtain here. Uh, in the I cell than in any of the constituent data types. This is additional information, functional information that emerged from the fusion despite of no overlap in these networks. These I cells are not random. They are far from random while protein interaction networks we could safely model with geometric models. We really don't know what this new model is, this I cell, but let's leave that aside. 
And here to say that uh, each data uh, set contributes uh, uh, to this fusion, and you can see how the percentage of enriched genes increases as we add more data into this fusion. Okay, so um, now we have these tissue specific networks uh, from the data PPI, GI, coexp, and I cells. And then let's see what they tell us. Now um, we find between cancer and control tissues, these four ones that are on the top of the screen, the genes that are cancer silenced, cancer activated, always silenced, so they're not in either cancer or control or always activated, present in both cancer and control. And interestingly, it's these that are always expressed that are enriched in drivers. Once we found that out, uh, we, we focused on these genes that are always expressed. Uh, and uh, in these cancer and control, four different types of data, including our eye cell, we checked most three wire genes. We did that by graphlets. This is why I talk about graphlets and checked the enrichment of drivers. And we found that only in eye cells, not in PPI, not in GI, not in COEX, but only in eye cells rewiring of the genes is indicative of uh, involvement in cancer. So basically the top uh, 500 most rewired ones and enriched in drivers and driver related pathways. Mm, great. So then we, for our four most frequent cancers in human, we took top 20 of the most rewired genes in cancer eye cells. And there were not 80 because some were, there was some overlap. There were 63 of them. And we almost, we validated almost all of them either in literature, these are uh, PubMed IDs, uh, or uh, through knockdown experiments that we did in the lab. So for instance, if we knock down this uh, gene in breast cancer cells, we get significantly reduced viability in cancer. Sorry, if we knock down these genes <laughs> in this <laughs> cancer cells, the same is process, or significantly increased viability. So they do something. Also through survival currents, we went back to retrospective data of patients and then these patients with these uh, properties with these genes uh, had different survival and notice that only 17 out of these 63 or 27 percent are differentially expressed in cancer so not only differential expression can uncover all of this that emerged or fusion once we figured this out we went pan cancer everything we could find 20 cancers in total did the same sort of thing and then found the most, uh, the highest uh, rewired genes. And actually we have this top prediction, this one uh, that was not known to have anything to do with cancer before. And we went to the human protein atlas and found that basically it uh, indicates different survival in patients of eight different cancer types. So here I would conclude with the eye cell. Uh, so basically it's a new uh, concept. Uh, we get new cancer related genes that emerge from the fusion. Um, um, we need to go beyond any of these data types, including differential uh, expression, et cetera, et cetera. And it's versatile. We can do many things with them. And let me just illustrate what we can do. This is our ongoing work in rare thrombophilia. Uh, we have very few patients. This is a very severe case of thrombophilia that is only present in northern Italy, in the Balkans, and the Far East. Uh, we only have five subjects, two families, two brothers, one diseased, one healthy, but the diseased brother has, a, uh, sorry, but the healthy brother has a daughter that, who is diseased, and we have two sisters, and then very few uh, uh, patients. Uh, we, we cannot do much with that, but if we do this kind of patient fusion, we have patients, germline mutations to their genes, we have these uh, different interaction types, then we can minimize this objective function similar to what we did before. And we get clusters, for instance, this cluster uh, is specific with mutations specific only to the diseased women. And these are mutations specific only to the healthy brother. So we suspect that these mutations are protecting the healthy brother, but this is an ongoing work. Uh, this is an illustration how this is a machine learning method that provides mechanistic explanations. You can uh, fuse heterogeneous data types, not only on the genes, on the, the same entities, such as uh, protein interactions or genetic interactions, but uh, between patients and 
the mutations, for instance, of their genes, or patients and the drugs that they could receive or have received, or between drugs and uh, uh, the, the places where they bind, the proteins that they bind to, et cetera. And here, basically, you're decomposing these matrices across these data types and sharing these matrix factors. And let me not go into this. This is a study from 2002. There's 16 that we published in the Pacific Symposium on Biocomputing for uh, ovarian cancer patients, where from this same formula, we read three tasks of precision medicine, patient stratification from the cluster of patients, cancer gene prediction from the clusters of enriched cancer genes, and drug repurposing from these uh, drug target interactions that through matrix completion property we fill in based on the data. And again, all of the data contribute to this fusion and you get higher uh, precision recall, raw curves, et cetera, when you include all the data. And finally, a little bit about COVID. We put this on a preprint archive so you can read it, uh, of course. Uh, ongoing pandemic, I don't need to tell you about this. You're probably all sick and tired of this already and frustrated and want to contribute, right? So we have seen uh, quite a while ago from Krogan's lab, the first protein interaction map between viral proteins and human proteins. And since then there were more, but you know, in cancer cell lines, so it's questionable. Uh, here is also at the same time in May, uh, a study of uh, expression in the lung tissue of patients of COVID. Um, uh, so expression data. So we constructed again, these networks from uh, SARS-CoV, from the viral proteins. These are viral host interactions. Then we have molecular interaction network that we construct from protein interaction, gen genetic interaction, and metabolic interactions because metabolism here is very important. And we have drug target interactions, drugs targeting human gene products, proteins, right? And then this is just where the data is from. Um, and then we again factorize these matrices, viral host interactions. Here is the factor with the genes. These are human genes to drugs. We regularize by drugs, chemical similarities, molecular interaction networks. And then by co-clustering, we get clusters of genes and drugs emerging from all of these data and matrix uh, uh, completion for drug repurposing these DPIs, right? And we get, again, clusters. Uh, uh, with, with uh, uh, much higher enrichment uh, in terms of genes and drugs, et cetera, in terms of uh, biological uh, go annotations or drug categories from drug bank, et cetera, then we could get without, uh, without uh, this fusion. Um, this is, I, I would not uh, focus on this. This is basically that it works, that we have good, uh, good uh, uh, results when we do that. And now, uh, uh, let's focus on this because we want to repurpose known drugs to be able to uh, faster bring cure to these patients, if possible at all, to help in these efforts. Uh, we focus on drug target interactions of, of these, and we uh, predicted uh, uh, over 800 of them. So about 500 drugs targeting around 200 genes, human genes. Now, basically, we are bringing this, we are not going into antivirals. Antivirals are hard to, 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 to design. Uh, very specific, we have very few of them, but we are going into the human host and we want to target the drugs, the human host to better the person, right, who is infected. We only focus on FDA approved drugs to reduce the number of them, okay? Uh, and we have certain validations in the databases that we didn't use for the fusions, so we are confident that this method works. And now we went into back into the molecular interaction network and we have viral interactors, right? So from the virus to the human host. So these are human host uh, interactors with the viral proteins. Then we have in human differential expressed genes, okay? And nothing is very specific there and we cannot really target those very well. But the common neighbors, you go into the molecular network and the common neighbors of the human viral interactors and the differential expressed genes, that intersection is very large and very unique in its structure, in, in terms of its degree, centrality, clustering coefficient, uh, the, the different kinds of centralities, also in terms of the graph. So these common neighbors in the human molecular network are specific, also in terms of the graphlets, very, very different than the rest. 
we then when we found out that these common neighbors of the human viral interactors and the differentially expressed genes are specific in, in topology, in the wiring in the molecular interaction network, then we went to see functionally and the fun they're functionally enriched uh, in, in the viral processes, while the other uh, sets of the, uh, of the nodes are not. And then basically we would decided that these are, because they are so, uh, 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 they're very central and very connected, probably this is the best place to heat with already approved drugs. Uh, so we reduce the number of, uh, uh, down to, uh, to 100, around 150 drugs targeting about 50 human genes. 11% uh, of them are already in clinical trials. 70% of them are already in Corona drug interactions database, Cordite. Um, and then we went a little bit more into the functional analysis of these particular genes, right? That, we propose should be targeted, and we found enrichments in interesting processes, but all of them uh, link to VGF, uh, VEGF uh, uh, signaling and nitric oxide signaling. And you can read the details in this paper because I should conclude this presentation soon. Uh, but basically, all of these other ones that they have this, this commonality. Uh, and then we propose modulation of, of these uh, kinds of pathways uh, 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 for treating patients. And uh, I would like to conclude. So basically this methodology is versatile. You can put into it all DNA elements, um, expressions, methylations, copy number variations, skin, clinical profile similarity, treatments, adverse effects, um, et cetera, et cetera. However, each time you pose this problem, uh, you have a different NP-hard continuous optimization problem for which you have to propose the objective function optimization solver, probe convergence and correctness. And of course, optimization will be slow. So you need high performance computing to do this. I will not talk about other things that we did. We did just to conclude that I hope I conveyed the message that we're dealing with a complex system of heterogeneous interacting entities that each of these data types that we have is limited, but they all have complementary information. And this is why they see joint organization and mining within the same framework. Uh, everybody knows that these are important issues. I already acknowledge my grants, which is required in every talk. <laughs> so this is why I have to put them on many slides. So to holistically mine all the data, we need paradigm shifts, conceptual, but also methodological, conceptual. We have to analyze all data types within the same framework in a new bottom-up data-driven uh, concepts, biological concepts we need to generate from these data. And they may tell us that, uh, cell may be governed by yet undiscovered principles of life. So we have to rethink biology and approaches to medicine. We've seen only the first prototype I cell. Uh, methodologically, we've seen that even when mathematical formalisms do exist, for instance, to capture multi-scale organizations such as hypergraphs, we don't have algorithms to mind. I and mean, this is why we did hypergraph lets, simplices, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to utilize dependencies, for instance, in the local network topology that we did with graphics and orbits, which are data set dependent. And this is why these methods work uh, to uncover low, uh, late and low dimensional structure of the data, exploit the structure for discovering efficient tool sets for particular data only, because this is the best we can do. And, but no matter what we do, unless somebody proves P equals MP, computational issues remain with us due to computational interactability and large slices of our data. And this is why training is key. We have to train embedded data scientists that will be uh, uh, solving problem specific uh, uh, things in, in specific labs and designing these heuristics. And to that end, I've uh, written this book with colleagues uh, one or two years ago. It was published by Cambridge University Press. This is a textbook and it has 13 chapters. Five of them are written by my lab, the rest by uh, contributing, contributing, including Karsten's chapter is there. So I think this is a very good introduction for uh, people from all sorts of uh, backgrounds into this. And we have to work with biomedical collaborators and industry. Uh, also, I'm taking this hopefully strictly out of academic setting, trying to 
uh, scale out and productize ISEL. And ERC, I cannot thank them more. They were instrumental for my transition from the US A to EU, and none of that would be done without them. And of course, I thank other uh, uh, funding agencies. And none of this could have been possible without my group members. I acknowledge them all, also my collaborators. We are currently hiring. Please email me if you're interested at all levels, postdocs, PhD students, research engineers. And this is how my group looked uh, like in Barcelona. This is part of the group only uh, a couple of years ago. This was last year when we could still travel to retreat. And this is this year all. And I would like to thank you all for your attention and take some questions. Dasha, we thank you for this uh, very clear and comprehensive uh, introduction to this to, to your work. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we send a round of virtual applause to you. <laughs> and uh, we now have the time for a few questions. Um, let's start with Inside the Network on Zoom. So please raise your hand if you have a question. I don't see a raised hand yet, so, so I will start. Natasha, this is this is very exciting work. I mean, I've, I've also uh, like, as I said, more than already more than ten years ago, I read your papers about graphlets and these network motifs that you are studying. Now, one question: Do these biological networks tend to be incomplete, or they tend to be, or and they tend to be false positive? So we can't, we cannot fully trust these edges. Sometimes has has someone systematically. Uh, examined how this affects the space of graphlet. So I mean studies like uh, simulating networks, simulating a certain ratio of uh, missing edges or false positive edges, and then seeing how this affects the graphlet spectrum exactly. or the network motif spectrum of the graph. Exactly. And this is what I said, just uh, they're robust to know. Yeah. yeah. Even from the first paper in 2004, where I introduced these graphlets, yeah. basically we tested robustness to know. So basically we randomly add certain percentage of edges or rewire or remove, etc. And these methods, depends on the method, they're all heuristic, right? But sometimes they can tolerate, especially these like with the orbits and stuff. So they can tol tolerate even up to 70%. This is a lot of noise that they can tolerate, right? And, mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the, the quality of the data, even as early as like 2004, there were huge efforts, for instance, funded by the Canadian government that actually experts, postdocs, read the papers and confirm the validity of interactions. And since then, the methodology has improved and, and many different labs confirmed interactions. So if there was an interaction, we're pretty sure there, was, there, there is an interaction there. It's just the data will be sparse. <laughs> you will not have all linked to all by any stretch of imagination. Uh, but of course, some things cannot be tested because uh, we only have such uh, biotechnology right now. So there will be more. And what about biases in data collection? So, yeah, for, yeah. For, for instance, a certain bias um, that one gene or protein is particularly relevant for the biomedical community. So, they study all the interactions of that protein and they are very much covered, whereas for other proteins, the knowledge is very incomplete. Let's say you have a big hub in the network and that hub creates a lot of smaller graphlets attached to, to that node. So is this, is this um, impact or problem like fully understood or can you correct in your methods for these terms of biases? Yeah, you can. You can correct. I mean, you, these algorithms, you can do whatever you want. Uh, for instance, these sticky proteins, for instance. I mean, some of them are really sticky, disordered proteins, and there's no bias. They're just there always, right? It's not that they've not, you know, they've been more studied. In the, in the early studies, of course, like back like 20 years ago, roughly, it was very, the data were severely biased by, by, by these, you know, like certain types, you know, uh, um, uh, bait and prey, you know, you're only interested in this pathway, it has 15 uh, proteins, you tag them, you pull everything down. So you have all of these 15 will be your hubs, right? Because you pull down, I don't know, hundreds, right, with these 15. And of course, then you will have this scale-free topology. But even as early as 2004, this scale-freeness uh, faded a little bit because when people started studying more and actually when biologists uh, started being aware of this and then basically when they started this matrix approach right all to all in, in a certain region and then for instance uh, Mark Vidal uh, at Harvard he I mean he's a pioneer of these these two hybrid methods where basically all of these all to all are basically let's explore the entire space of yeast uh, arabidopsis human and you know we'll work together on some of these things so yeah we're we we are doing efforts uh, on that uh, it, 
if it's deemed that there is still some more bias, you can always correct algorithm. Very good. Are there further questions? If not, I have a higher level question for you, which is um, similar to myself. You have been working a lot on these on these um, explicitly defined network statistics, like the, the graphlets and other types of patterns in the network. Now there's this alternative uh, way of, of doing deep learning on, on graphs. The previous talk by Matthias Nippert was about that. So do you see a role for that? Do you see a, maybe a particular type of so in, in, your, in your world and in your work for, for deep learning on graphs, is there, are there maybe problems that you couldn't solve so far with, with the, the more statistics or count-based approaches where you see a, a big potential for deep learning? Yeah, yeah. When, when you think about it, I mean, again, I'm not a machine learning expert. I mean, I kind of add machine learning on as I need and we modify some methods. But I mean, factorizations, you know, mm -hmm. this, uh, <laughs> I mean, this is this can be brought down. This is equivalent to to uh, some deep learning, right? So in the sense, I mean, you now we are toying a lot with with these embedding methods, like everybody else, right? Uh, and, and you can do these embeddings various ways, either through, through neural networks or through factorization. Some of them are completely equivalent, etc. Uh, it all depends what, what you want to do. But I think the integration of all of these approaches would be necessary, absolutely, uh, uh, to, to solve these problems. And we, Thank you. Let, let's see where it takes us. But yes, yes. There's one question from the YouTube audience that I'm reading out. Thanks for the interesting talk. You have mentioned using IID, the database for PPIs. Could you comment on using the string database for the PPI information? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we used string. It's just we used IID uh, when it was available. I think maybe it was brought down recently. I, I don't understand why. String is also great. It's just for filtering for us, it was easier to use IID because we never want to deal with predicted interactions. We only want a biologically, you know, uh, interactions coming from biological experiments. And if you want further confidence, more confident data than even that various labs confirmed the interactions. But uh, yeah, we have used string, I mean, in this particular illustration of the method, not, but yeah, my school. Good, Great. thank you. Great place, yes. I'm checking that there, there are any further questions. In fact, there are none and we are right on time. So thank you very much, Natasha, for joining us today. Thank you very much for this great uh, talk and overview. We appreciated it. Um, Thanks for the invitation. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, you're most welcome. This was a, a great uh, talk and element of our symposium. Thank you very much.